Welcome to the Alouette's Flight Deck, podcast dedicated to Montreal Alouette's football, sponsored by Sport Buff. I am your host, Tim Capper, along with Cliff. Hey, Cliff, it's good to see you virtually again after seeing you literally on Friday. <laughs> I know, right? It feels like it's been a hot minute since we got to see each other live in person, especially in a football atmosphere as well. Yeah, That's okay. pretty exciting. Yeah, I know. It was great to be back at Percival Molson after all those days. Um... We have a lot to talk about from the ex- <laughs> from the experience to the game to everything. <laughs> yeah, we've 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 had a lot of time to sit and think about things, especially after what we saw Friday night. So we, uh, you know, p- pull up a chair, folks, uh, grab a drink. Uh, you know, we're, we're going to be here for a little bit. So, mm-hmm. so we're going to do something new and I'm actually going to let you start. Let's start, uh, you know, with what you thought about, you know, not necessarily the game itself, but I mean, cause we can go with the entire experience itself being back at Percival Molson, but, um, you know, besides the, the parking, <laughs> the parking issues that you ran into, but you made it, but you made it for kickoff. So yep. what, uh, g- give us a, g- give everybody your thoughts on, on the, g- uh, the game outside of the game, I guess we could say. All right. Well, yeah, uh, I mean, parking in Montreal is always, uh, let's call it what it is. It's a sh- <laughs> show. Mm-hmm. There's there's no two ways about it. Uh, the p- place where I normally park my car, uh, turns out they were closed because they were filming a movie there. So like, okay, go to plan B. Problem is, uh, where the stadium's located and where some of the signage is, and clearly it's been, you can tell it's been a year and a half since I've been in that area of the city. Because they seem to change a whole bunch of stuff around, and uh, I end up having to do like a practically another tour of the city just to get to where I want to go. And literally everybody else like is was so congested parking wise just to get into the parking garage that I also would go to on occasion for game days. Even getting into that was a trial, to put it mildly. I mean, you were literally crawling into the parking garage. It was disgusting <laughs> and then i'm down at the very level the, the bottom level like you cannot go any lower than what i have gone it was crazy and then yeah i'm, I'm hoofing it to the stadium <laughs> it's, it's hilarious like this is the most exercise i've done in about a year this is insane but yeah just literally made it for kickoff just by the balls of my ass it was unbelievable <laughs> so finally get into the stadium and i was very shocked i'm like this is more than 12,500 people. Yeah, I'm kidding. sure of it. Yeah, yeah. So I I, I'm, I, I didn't know what to say. Like, uh, it was so good to see you and Chris, you know, in our in our normal spots. Like, that little bit of normalcy felt so good. Mm-hmm. Even though, you know, you look around and like, okay, we're wearing masks. Not very many other people were at their seats. And, okay, fine. I mean, technically, you didn't have to wear a mask at your seat. So right. I, I get it. Yeah. You know, like, you know, you have to wear it when you're walking around inside the stadium, going to the washrooms, going to the concession stands, what have you. Fine. You know, and again, I was okay wearing it throughout the game. We've said this in the past. This is what we would be doing until further notice. And I was okay with that. You know, throughout the game itself, though, I mean, look, I, I was – make no mistake. I am very thrilled to be back at Percival Molson Stadium. What I'm not thrilled about, though, is the extracurriculars that have been going on. I know there's been a lot of changes, and a lot of them have to do with COVID. I accept that. Yeah. That's not my beef. My beef, though, is I really felt with the whole in-game experience that they're trying to sell to everybody, they didn't do it very well. I mean, we're back to the same old hijinks that we've seen in years past, where you have these you know, TV timeouts, and you have these little contests, these little things where you know stuff happens up on the big screen, or you're trying to rally the crowd, but you're doing it. While the Alouettes are on offense, I don't understand it. I will never understand it. I could live to be 100 watching football games at Percival Molson Stadium, and I will never understand why the Alouettes can't get it through their thick skulls not to do this shit. It's frustrating. It is beyond frustrating because you see the players, too. They're, they're looking around like, what the heck? What, 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 what? Like, no, no. Like, yes, they're making noise on defense, too. But they're not the, the same efforts that they've been doing to, you know, get the wave going and ringing cowbells and all this other bullshit <laughs> that, you know, you've become accustomed to with the, the Alouettes trying to, you know, rally the troops. You're doing it on offense, not defense. It's not that hard, people. Take a look at this. Look, do the Alouettes have the ball? Is Vernon Adams on the field? Yes. Then shut the fuck <laughs> up. 
Otherwise, make the noise. Yes, absolutely make noise when there's a defense. Absolutely do it. That it works. It freaking works. Yeah, and it's it's beyond maddening that in 2021 we haven't had football in over 600 days, and it still feels like you're back to square one. Like, is this your first day at work? Give me a break. And what bugs the hell out of me, Eric Godet, who we've had on this show, a great PA announcer, does a hell of a job getting the crowd hyped up. He's going along with all this nonsense, too. I don't get it. You'd think he, of, of all the people, you'd think he would clue and like, yo, yo, guys, 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 you, I know you want me to yell and, you know, make noise and blah, blah, blah. Why don't we wait until the Alouettes are not on offense? Let's do it on defense. And to again, to his credit, they weren't making noise on defense. I'm not going to take that away. But you're doing this nonsense while they're on offense. You're trying to encourage the wave while they're on offense. You want them ringing cowbells and, you know, whatever dopey promotions you have going on while on offense. It's ridiculous. Stop it. Uh, yeah. it, it, it. It drives me insane. Like, you want to talk like this is something I've talked about in the alternative is you want to know why people consider the CFL Bush League because of stuff like this. And it doesn't just happen in Montreal. It happens in just about every stadium in the Canadian Football League. I've heard about it. I've got people that message me throughout Canada. Oh, it was like this at the Lions game. It was like this at the Elks game. It was like this at the Red Blacks game. I mean, like it's it's ridiculous. Yes, they make noise on defense. But they're making noise on offense as well. And here's the problem. When the team encourages you to do this, everybody goes along with it. It's like Pavlov's dog. You ring the bell, you know, a pun fully intended, and everybody starts salivating. And they, they go along with the, with the show. It's ridiculous. So you know they're going to follow you no matter what they say. Just say it right. Do it right. Do it. Figure it out. Take a goddamn look in the field and see what's going on. You see that the team is on offense. Be quiet. Make sure you're quiet so that Vernon and his receivers, everybody's on the same page. Because I'm, I'm not going not, not to blame the crowd for the result of last Friday's game versus the Hamilton Tiger Cats. But holy cow, like, <laughs> I can't help but wonder if maybe, maybe just a little bit could have changed had the team treated the team on the field just a little bit better mm-hmm. as far as nonsense like this. It's got to stop. I mean, thankfully, it's just one game. The Alouettes have six other games to get it right. And so help me God, they've got to get it right because it's embarrassing. It is embarrassing to see a professional quote unquote football team behave in such a manner. I guarantee you no NFL team is doing nonsense like that. No NCAA team is doing stuff like that. Their fans know what the hell's going on. They know not to make noise when the team is on offense. It's, it's not that hard. Why any team in the CFL can't seem to wrap their heads around this in 2021 just absolutely positively blows my mind. Yeah, I, there are there are quite a few issues I had to too. I mean, it, for me, um, yeah, for me it was great to be back in the stadium. As everybody saw with the pictures that we put on, out on social media, yeah, we were happy to be back. Uh, but um, I got there forty five minutes until kickoff, so there's no problems with me getting in. You know, they were still wanting people to get in in, in the stadium, which is no problem. Obviously, you can't bring in some bags, even though I did notice there were some bags in the stadium. But some people were actually taking advantage of the uh, of the clear bags that the Alouettes gave out years ago to season ticket holders. So those are being used. Um, I was actually very displeased on how social distancing and masking were handled, just like you. Um, I mean, I do I mean, understand yeah. that personal Molson has its challenges. But, but but fans were just still way too close. Way too close, in my opinion, in the stand. And I get it, as you said. The Alouette said that as long as, you know, as long as you're sitting at your seat, you can go ahead and have your masks off. Mm-hmm. 95, it, where we were, we, at least we could see 95% of people had their masks off. Now, yep. would it have made a difference if the Alouette said if you were actively eating? Because if I'm not mistaken, before the mask mandates in Major League Baseball were lifted... That's what the rule was. Unless you were actively eating or drinking, you had to keep your mask on. Mm-hmm. I think if I'm not mistaken, if I'm not mistaken, it was also like that for the Canadians when they had their playoff run. Was you had to be wearing your mask at all times unless you were sitting at your seat and eating and drinking. Otherwise, it, you, you kept it on. Yeah. And yeah, that's, yeah. That, that, that was the rule back then. I, I think that's what it should be at personal Molson. At least I understand it was the first game. But I mean, people need to remember that. Uh, we are still in a pandemic. Uh, we really are. And I'm not here to harp on that. But I am very curious. And I'll go on to my next points. I'm very curious to see how the crowd may change at the next home game. Being that at the date that we're taping this podcast 
is the very first day of the vaccine passport. Mm -hmm. So we will have to deal with that going into stadium. So it, it will have to be used. So I'm curious to know if the crowd will be different. But yeah, just less than 15,000. Just less than 15,000 people were in the stadium. It was good to see. All the sections were open. You could see it after, you know, I saw it on TV and stuff like that. All the sections were open because they had to be in order for spacing. Mm -hmm. But there, there were there were still other issues beside that. I'm just, again, uh, will I feel safer next game, even with the vaccine passport? Potentially, I'm still going to wear a mask. A um, couple of other things, too. Um, for, pe for people who didn't watch the game or couldn't see because I had a couple of people text me during the game. There's no fan zone in the end, in the end zone this year nope. at all and the cheerleaders have their own little section in the in where basically the fan zone is and that's where they were kept for the entire time and i thought it was uh it was an interesting choice but then i happened to read in the ottawa paper that that's exactly what the red blacks did for their home opener too so we're right. not alone nope so that, that that was fine that was fine um by the way you're talking about how they're you know with the they were doing things on offense when they shouldn't have been. I'm curious to see what, because you know, usually there's a script made out on for football operations or game day operations during the game. I'm curious to need, know how, what that read. I really am, because usually you do it on defense or when they're, or when they're in the huddle. You, you don't do it. I understand that TELUS gave away all, all, all those kettlebells. I understand that. But still, come on. No, and I, I think it was great that they get there. I, again, I'm not, we're not saying don't make noise during the football game. Yeah. We're just saying do it properly. And it's on the Alouettes and their game game day crew. I'm, I'm sure they have a game day director, someone who manages and coordinates all of these TV timeouts, these promos, these everything that's you know basically the what makes up the actual in game experience. Whoever it was drop the ball massively because again you can't just run people out there and do this shtick and have it work i mean like it kind of defeats the purpose of giving away these cowbells if people are just going to be ringing them all over the t all the time all over the place it, there's a purpose to something like this and something else that bothered me too like they kept talking about like the, this whole thing about light up the stadium yeah. like you're trying to replicate that magic that happened back in October 2019 with against the Calgary Stampeders when everybody whipped out their cell phone lights and they're playing the music and the crowd was going crazy. They want they wanted so badly to replicate that. Yeah, the lightning bug game, as I call it. Yeah, exactly. And it was amazing. That was a moment in time. But they were trying to f manufacture that feeling. And you can't do that. No. You know what it reminded me of? No. Think of any movie that's had a sequel or a, a trilogy. Okay. How many times do you say, okay, the first movie was amazing. The second movie sometimes is amazing too, but sometimes the sequel kind of falls flat. Like you think of, uh, I'll, I'll give you an example, like Spider-Man 3. Okay. Was like with Tobey Maguire. I'm right, I was about to say. <laughs> we, I guess we have to make it clear. Okay. The Spider-Man trilogy from the early 2000s. First one, decent. The second one was actually better than the first, if you can believe that. But number three just fell flat. It just felt like you're trying too hard to capture that same magic from before. And yeah, yeah, there's a couple of callbacks, a couple of reminders of the you know the, the original th uh, the original film that gave you that feeling of excitement and hope and everything. And it's like, uh, okay, you know, like you you, you kind of chuckle because you kind of remember that tiny right, little right, moment. Right. But for the most part, it just felt, as I said, manufactured and forced upon you. Like you're trying too hard to. I understand what you were trying to do, but you just didn't. It just didn't feel the same because it felt fake. It felt put on. You know. Mm -hmm. Like with the lights and uh, you know all of that, it, it was just so poorly executed. That was, and it was such a bummer because it kind of puts a damper on things. C couple that with the performance we saw from the Alouettes on the field. I mean, it just made for like you're happy. Yes, you are happy to be back at Molson Stadium for the first time in ages. But like I said, they I understand what they were trying to do, and it was just so poorly executed. And it's a real bummer because, God forbid, if that was someone's first trip to Molson Stadium after hearing about all the hype, like, oh, I remember 2019, everybody was so jazzed to be at the stadium and everything like that. And you walk out of there, like, after this past Friday, you're like, okay, that, that's what everybody was all excited about? Okay, well, whatever. Again, it didn't help with the game either, but still. Um, uh, the other things, too, that really stood out to me is the, the, them changing the touchdown song. I don't even know what the new touchdown song is now. Um, but last year, I always felt that that uh, uh, "J'aime les oiseaux" was a good touchdown song. But you were able to find out some information on why it's possibly more likely not played anymore. 
So I kind of understand now. Mm -hmm. all, all I will say to those is that it had to do with a Me Too possible issue. So I'll leave it at that. Yep. I didn't hear that. Uh, but also, they got rid of fan interaction by removing the Take Me Home Country Road song. Big time. And, and that it, was it, and that and I felt that that was a going to be a continuous thing. It should have been. I mean, uh, they didn't have a set time playing it in 2019. Right. But you, it was during a TV timeout, no matter what. Anytime they ever played that it was during a TV timeout and people just got into it. And it was awesome. It, it, like I said, I, I'm not a country music fan by any stretch of the imagination. But there was just something about that and just the way and just how everybody got into it. was is, It was is, awesome. Is John Denver really country or is he folk? Uh, <laughs> that's a good question. Rather than Bob Denver, who was a first mate. <laughs> right. Little buddy. Um, <laughs> yeah, but... Again, I guess that's a debate for another podcast, but <laughs> <laughs> but to not have that was disappointing. I mean, like John to me, like Denver that, and, versus and that was Bob the one thing I was Denver, who <laughs> will be the best first mate next? Denver, Denver versus Denver. Yeah, yeah, Denver is in Denver. I love it. <laughs> next on the Alouettes flight deck. Dun, dun. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I mean, they nothing. The music really didn't stand out. I guess I'll have to get try to really pay attention more next game but those are the couple of things that i remember right after the game it's like wait a touchdown song and no john denver and i, I understand they, the the light the lighting that you're talking about had to do they were using that i guess they're using the, their money's worth because of the of the dj at halftime which i liked by the way i will uh, that was pretty good the dj and the lights that they had within stadium did quite well because they were able to use that and the uh choking uh smoke machine at the beginning of the game and <laughs> <laughs> and the lights for the players that worked out well because they took away the uh, uh the wwe elimination chamber bird cage uh, <laughs> at least for this season uh and finally for me though and 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 i understand that yes the alouettes have had some issues and a lot ever a lot of businesses are having this too cliff where they are unable to hire people or get people to come back or people have left because of either being furloughed and they found something else or just they found something else and they left the team. The merchandise boutiques uh, were a shadow of their former selves under Cam, who was the general manager or the manager of the boutiques. Mm. Uh, from what I saw and from what I heard, from what I heard rather, limited merchandise, smaller selection, and some of the locations where they had them were very dark and uh, inadequate lighting, like the main store over by the main, or by, by the main entrance. They've got to improve on this. I under, I mean, it's like, I, I just don't get it. I've been told that uh, a lot of the people that are, are, uh, that are helping this year uh, are the ones, uh, some of the, uh, some of the coworkers with uh, Tricola, the ones that have the boutique for the, for the Can uh, Canadian. That's fine. But still, I don't remember seeing a single jersey on sale. I didn't go upstairs to see if the if it if the uh jersey shop was up and running where you can put numbers on them. I don't remember seeing that. Hmm. I understand it's the first game back. You also had two weeks, two weeks to figure this Three. out. Three. Three to figure it out. Now I don't know who's in charge currently, but that has to get better. Because if I'm hearing complaints that means many other fans are not happy with what they were offered. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, things things just got to get better. I understand it's the first season after, but I don't remember hearing these things from the other from the other teams. No, and and, and I can't and I can say this won't be the case in Ottawa because <laughs> Cam is now head of I guess we could say merchandising for the Red Blacks. Yep. Shout out to Cam, by the way. Shout out to Cam. We miss you, buddy. Big time. We really do. <laughs> yeah. I, I I will go back to one thing as far as the, uh, the music choice and all that goes. I I, I have to laugh because uh, DJ Wordy Word, who does the the yeah. music along with Eric Adet, yeah. every now and again they they know just the right song to play for mm -hmm. certain instances, mm -hmm. and just like little touches. And I, I'm sure you didn't catch this, Tim, but uh, after the Alouettes, basically, you know, like after the final nail in the coffin was uh, was drilled in by the Tiger Cats, they did play a song by. Uh, a Quebec or a Franco singer named Lisa Leblanc. The title of the song is Aujourd'hui, ma vie, c'est de la merde, which <laughs> roughly translated is Today, 
my life is shit. <laughs> and I thought that was just the perfect song to play, not just for what we saw on the field, but for <laughs> off the field as well. It was just, you know, like the icing on the cake yeah. right there, like the cherry on top. Mm-hmm. Like that was just perfect. Absolutely yeah. perfect. Uh, so I, I'll give them props for that. I mean, I can't give them props for anything else in relations to the in-game experience, but just like I said, little, little things like that, little nuggets of wisdom like that, that they drop and like I said, it's one of those if you know, you know kind of things. Yeah. And uh, I, like I said, I got to give props to them for that. For sure. The other thing, too, before we get to the game, um, and, th- and this is this is not just a, a bash fest here. This is something I actually liked. And I, it's because I finally knew the reason why. It was so weird. For the, you fans who may have not noticed, or you may have only seen something that's on TV, is that for the first time since the Alouettes have returned to Montreal, there's not a single solitary ad on the field, not a single one. And why is that? And this is a question that actually came from Herb Zerkowski because he was wondering himself, which I saw on social media. For those of you who don't know, all ads this year are being are being generated virtually, right? Through TSN, and I'm guessing RDS also. I, I haven't watched the RDS broadcast. I don't know if they're the same ads, but they're all local ads that would usually be on the field, local and and. Uh, um, Ads that were are for the league, you know, advertising for the league too. It was an, it was an interesting look. I didn't mind it. <laughs> no, no. I mean, you could definitely have a lot of fun with uh, virtual ads. You can have fun. Like you can sort of uh, intersperse the team logo on center field if they don't already have it there. Well, it's I like mean, BC. I had forgotten that BC shares their stadium with uh, with the White Caps of MLS. I was like, well, mm-hmm. wait a minute, why is there a logo? It's like, um, and it just hit me after putting social, something on social. It's like, oh, yeah, that's why. Yeah. So them in Toronto. Yeah, I was going to say Toronto shares their their stadium with uh, Toronto FC. Yeah. So same idea, which right. makes a lot of sense. So obviously for our hope, we're, we're looking for the next game on the 18th, home game on the 18th. We're hoping to see what the difference is when it comes to the masking and because of the vaccine passport. Uh, I, I, I'm, sounds like they're going based on because it's open air. Anyways, Mm -hmm. and I'm hoping there is a huge improvement on what is offered to fans in stadium as far as merchandise, because in the many years that I've been a social, uh, a season ticket holder with the Alouettes, it it was just, I'm sorry. Yeah, it it was just a, it was a piss poor job. It really was. And I, I hope our, uh, our friend of the show, Mario Ciccini is listening to this because I mean, president of the Alouettes, I mean, he has to know, he has to know what's going on Mm -hmm. and, for someone who's worked in television and worked in media, it's all about presentation, right? It's all about putting your best foot forward. And if I can be completely honest, the Alouettes didn't do that. I mean, that's really what it came down to. It was it was not a great product on the field. I know he has no control over that, but he can control. There's a lot of things he can control. And one of the things is the actual in-game experience. And, and it just didn't live up. It did not live up to it. I mean, yes, you're happy, as I said, that you got to be back in Percival Wilson Stadium, back to seeing live football again here in Montreal. But it just did not make for a pleasurable experience. No. It was not the football experience that it should be. And that's that's what's bothersome, is that it could be so much better. And it just takes a little bit of effort. It's it's like you're you're in a, going in a direction. It's, why don't we just make sure we're going in the right direction? Yeah. Yeah, it's I, simple. It's as simple as that. Yeah. Um, uh, as you all know, last week before we get to the games, uh, get to the game itself here, um, uh, we had a, a giveaway for our 600th follower, our, our, the m- milestone of reaching 600 followers on our Twitter account. Uh, first and foremost, thank everybody, everybody who has followed us, and I hope many. If you haven't already listened to it, you know, go ahead and, and click the the follow button. Uh, and to follow us on, on social media over at Alouette's FL Deck. But we said we, we wanted to, you know, we were going to give away something we have. We've already put it on social media, but at least we want to give props. Uh, it was for everybody who was currently a follower of our, of our Twitter account. And so everybody was in the draw. Uh, and by random draw, it came out to be uh, CA Marshawn, uh, who is uh, Marshawn CA919 on twitter um again congratulations thank you for being a a loyal listener or at least a listener (laughs) (laughs) um we really being a part of being a part of the flight crew exactly Uh, we appreciate it uh your the uh twitter uh the uh, the tweet has been sent your way the dm has been uh will be just dm us back and with all your deets and we'll get the uh 
we'll get the thing out to you. Um, also, it hasn't been uh, announced, but as you saw, um, that with us having Sport Buff on again for, for a little bit while, we're going to have another giveaway. Uh, the giveaway this week is going to be a uh, another one of their beautiful, beautiful caps. Um, so we will put it out on social media, which cap it's going to be. And like last time, you will need to retweet that tweet, that specific tweet on social media. Again, with the hashtag Sport Buff Contest. Sport Buff Contest. So stay tuned. We will show you on our social media uh, very shortly after the show airs what we'll be giving away this week. So again, you'll be retweeted with the hashtag Sport Buff Contest. And our thanks again for Sport Buff and Gary and Chris for continuing to support the Alouette's Flight Deck Podcast. Um, uh, the game. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear God. Uh, you know, I'm gonna, again, I'm going to try to, I'm going to let you start again. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the game itself, it started off pretty good. I mean, the Alouettes didn't end up losing, uh, was it 27 to 10? Thank you. 27, 10. That's how much I really want to forget it. Um, it started off. Okay. The Owls were close. The Owls were very close in this game, even though it was kind of, eh, Vernon didn't seem to be on again. Once again, William Stanbeck could not catch passes out of the backfield. I don't get this. I think it's up to four now. And you know it's bad when we're counting how many drops he's, he, he's, he's not, you know, how many drops he's had on these halfback screens. Mm-hmm. Four. And it wouldn't be so bad if it wasn't for the fact that the Hamilton run defense was top notch this past Friday. They had Stanbeck figured out big time. To the point where you wanted, you had no choice but to try to throw to him in order to try to generate something out of him, and he just he couldn't catch anything. Yeah, it was unbelievable. Like they they really truly had William Standback figured out. I mean, the only, I, I think I'm pretty sure Vernon Adams had more rushing yards than what uh, Standback did. <laughs> Very, uh, uh, it, if I'm not mistaken, I think they, I think they're actually dead on. <laughs> no, no, Standback had 12 more yards. But, oh, see, okay. but that was the problem. That was the problem. By, by the way, I said, you know, the, the final score was the final score was what it was. Um, Not but, great, Bob. <laughs> huh? Not great, Bob. No, no. Uh, official attendance uh, announced was 14,753. Again, you and I were both very surprised. Uh, you know, the Owls did all the scoring in the second quarter and then did uh, squat all after that. And, and, that's, and, that's and I think part the part that really bothered me is the fact that uh, they were down by three for a good part of the game. Mm-hmm. I mean, like they, like I said, you pretty much all of their offense came in the second quarter, and yeah. for the most part, they were still in this game they right were. up until the fourth quarter. Into the fourth, yeah, they were down by three into the fourth. Yeah, I mean, this was a winnable game. It's not like Hamilton was that much better. Like they were coming off a bye week, they're zero and two to start the season. I mean, they were—I won't say they were ripe for the pickings, but I mean, they were motivated. They—they they definitely thought if they couldn't beat Montreal, that this could be the beginning of the end for them already but i mean they they came out and they were motivated they just they had trouble they had their troubles with execution as well but they managed to put points on the board especially in that fourth quarter i mean once again vernon adams throws a pick and everything falls apart like a chinese motorcycle it, it it's unbelievable and i'm just looking at va going like bud what what what's happened man yeah. like like he went from being the Perfect quarterback, essentially, out in Edmonton. Like he could do no wrong. And okay, he had to he had to really work his ass off to get the Alouettes, you know, right to the edge against Calgary. But this this I, I I'll go so far as to say this was probably one of, if not the worst performance I've seen from him in an Alouettes uniform. Like I, I he he just had and, nothing and, go like And he had only one pick. That's the thing. Again, he was throwing in a double cut. See, everything was improved this game except for the offense. Yeah. The defense the Owls squandered an amazing defense this week. Oh, the defensive line was the 20, on fire. The 27 points does not equate at all this game. No. At all. I mean, when you have six sacks, I think it's the first time they've had six sacks since 2014. I think it's 2014 or 2016. But six sacks. Yeah. Everybody came to eat. Yeah. Michael Wakefield, he had himself a game. Two sacks. 
my God, he 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 was ragdolling Dave Dane Evans. It was a thing of beauty. Like everybody, like Nick Usher, like all these guys on the defensive line, they came to eat, and yeah. they didn't stop until their plate was cleared. It was <laughs> a thing of beauty. And what really, really is frustrating is this defense came alive. They did they did what they had to do. The only thing they didn't do was score points, which would have been nice because, quite frankly, the offense was just – nothing was clicking. No. And I just don't get it. Like that's that's the, the maddening part is you got your defense as balling out and giving giving it their all. They're even going out on the field longer than expected, and they're still hanging in there. That's one of the reasons why Hamilton only led by three for the better part of the game because this defense did its job. Offense, though, two and out, two and out, drop passes, missed passes, uh – could barely get any yardage. It was it was embarrassing, like just how bad this offense was. I, it's not for lack of talent. Lord knows there's, there's some very talented players there, but for whatever reason, there was just a major disconnect from Vernon and his receivers. Standback, like I said, got figured out early and often. It, it was a far cry from the first time we saw William Standback against the Tiger Cats when he literally ran roughshod for them over mm-hmm. them. This, like I said, they game planned for him big time. Vernon just couldn't get anything going. Yeah, uh, again, he was throwing in a double coverage. Again, he was overthrowing receivers. But the, again, drops. Again, drops seem to be an issue with this team. They they improved on on the on the penalties, which is a, which was amazing. And I, you know what I actually liked is how the players were trying to <laughs> entice the Hamilton pl- pl- players to try to get another penalty. That mm. I thought that was in, that was an interesting strategy. Cliff, it's gamesmanship. You look at this game, Cliff. Hamilton had the ball for a minute more than the Alouettes. Mm. You would think by the score that this thing was a total, it, well, it was a blowout on the scoreboard. Do you know how close this game was in total yardage? It's Hamilton incredible. had 288 yards on 51 plays. The Alouettes had 249 yards on 53 plays. That's how close this game was. Except on the scoreboard. Yeah, I mean, what what was the killer? The, turnovers, the, points the, off the, turnovers. The, v, the VA, yeah, the VA interception. Yeah, yeah. and then Sean Thomas Erlington, a Montreal native and a former Caribbean. Isn't it funny that all the Caribbeans that play for the Alouettes <laughs> and the one Caribbean that shined the most brightly in Montreal it ends up wearing is the one that's wearing black and yellow. Go figure. Yeah. I mean, props to him. I mean, he had a <laughs> especially well, towards the end, like that. That Reed got poster uh, postered. Reed got postered. You know, poor Greg. It happens. Oh. But wow. <laughs> well, and again, I, I again apologize for this bad pun. But sometimes you're the hammer. Sometimes you're the nail. And Hamilton definitely was the hammer. Yeah. So <laughs> it's true. I mean, Sean Thomas Erlington. He he had himself a game. He was motivated and. You know, that touchdown was just, as I said, the, the final nail in the coffin for the Alouettes. And that was just, yeah. but I think at that point, the wind had already gotten out of their sails. Oh, for sure. Just, oh, after after the VA interception and the score, oh, yeah, it was done. Yeah. It, it was so done. It was so done. Uh, VA, VA was 16 of 31 for 171 yards, an interception and a touchdown. That touchdown was the Quan, uh, excuse me. Uh, Quan Bray. Yes, it was yep. the Quan Bray in the first quarter. Um, it looked good. You know, Dane Evans, you know, uh, again, another backup quarterback, another 0-2 team coming in, and the Alouettes give another winless team their first win of the year. It's just so frustrating. I mean, Dane, I mean, he was 15-22. to 22. I mean, that that's pretty good for 183 yards. The, the, one of the big differences is, was, uh, is, was, was William Stanbeck, who had a, who had a grand total, I think it was four yards at halftime. Four. Mm-hmm. Four. This is not the same guy who almost averaged 100 yards over the first two games. He ended up with 40. And again, that, that just speaks to the run defense for Hamilton. They, they did their job, and they were missing some star players too, uh, the, the Tiger Cats. Mm. And they did what they had to do. That's, that's really what it came down to. It was that, it's that next man up mentality. And this defense for Hamilton, they really did the job. I mean, the fact that they kept, you know, they, they only allowed 10 points from the Alouettes, I think that says it all. Yep. Uh, leading receiver for the Owls was B.J. Cunningham at 59 yards on five receptions. Uh, then it was uh, Jake Winicky, uh, five receptions for 50 yards. Eugene Lewis, three for 46. Um, I think also, and, and, and by the way, this isn't all just sour grapes, you know, on, on how poorly that the Alouettes played. You have to give props to what the, what the, the, to the Hamilton special teams and the punting unit because Mario Offord has done, did nothing nothing at all 
in the first game. I will admit, in the first game since he scored that punt touchdown. Mm. Well, there was a little bit of excitement throughout the game. Like uh, he did uh, take a missed field goal out, and he had almost broke one away, but uh, penalty. Penalty. <laughs> that that that'll do it every single time. And it but, was on uh, the it was on the other side for for yeah. the uh, uh, for the for Hamilton. I mean, Frankie Williams. I mean, a hundred yards on five you know on five punt returns mm-hmm. uh the kickoff at the was it the kickoff at the beginning of the game also frankie frankie williams mm-hmm. uh, 80 and 49 yards to start the game yeah Th- that right there that right there well and it also speaks to uh you know the genius that is jeff reinbold as far as special Again, teams go yep i agree i am happy though i am happy with our our punting game i mean joseph zima man averaging 40 almost 47 yards a kick uh david cote on kickoffs uh, and also on, on by the way, the extra points, it was only one, but it was made. <laughs> okay. 100% completion. That's, yeah, and same thing, same thing with the kicks. There didn't seem an issue with, you know, since uh, since the other way switched over to Matt Schiltz this week. For so Hillary. now, Cliff, what is wrong with this team? Yes, it, we're one and two. Yes, we've lost two in a row. Yes, there are only 14 games in the 2021 season. You know, we're here. I, you know, we're hearing today from Joey Alfieri, who was on the Rod Peterson show. There are still issues in in practice. VA is getting picked off in the end zone. Stabek still is not catching passes out of the backfield. What is going on? Is it is it a soft sophomore slump as a starter for for VA? Is it not having training uh, practice? You know, having uh, preseason games. Saskatchewan's not saying that. Look at them. Nope. You know. What what's going on with the Owls? It's a great question, and again, it really does come down to the offense because this defense, as far as I can tell, there's not very many chinks in the armor. I mean, I, I think uh, defensively, this team is doing everything right. Special teams, they seem to have found themselves, as you said, uh, Joseph Zima and David Cote are doing a very excellent job in their respective positions, to the point where I'm thrilled to see a kicker and a punter as opposed to someone trying to do double duty. Mm-hmm. I, I'm not saying that was the reason for their woes in the past, but I mean, it's clear that you've got two very talented kickers doing what they can do to help this team out. So special teams is definitely not an issue. It really comes down to the offense. It, I don't know if it's the play calling all of a sudden, if Kahari's lost his magic, uh, if, if it's too much too soon for VA, I mean, I, I really think he, he can handle this. I really think he can get through this, but something's going on with him. And it starts with him. I'm, I'm not putting all the blame on, on Vernon Adams, but as the starting quarterback, he's got to shoulder a good part of it. His receivers, the same receivers he brought out to Seattle for his own little mini camp on his dime. What's happened? Why are they not connecting? William Stanbeck, gr- still a great, still a very d- dangerous weapon, still not being utilized properly. I mean, there, there's so many questions when it comes to this offense, and fingers have to be pointed. It also doesn't but, help that Williams not doing well. I mean, we 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 don't know the reason why he was he was dropped from from the from the Raiders when he went to the NFL. I mean, what is what is happening currently out of the backfield? Was that a catalyst to that? We don't know, but it's still continuing. I mean, he can still run the rock. Yeah, but, the, but now this seems to be this insistence to try and get him a catch. And it's it seems to be coming at the worst possible time. Like if it's second and long, you don't want to be trying to you know throw a, a hitch to your or a screen to your your your, your friggin' running back. Like he's not your check down. Like that's no. Even a shovel pass, Vernon tried at one point, and I it was almost suicidal because I thought it was going to get picked, but yeah. instead, thankfully, it just bounced out of Stanback's hands and hit the ground. Like just ugh. so once again, another incompletion, another two and out, and another drop pass. Yeah. Uh, you're 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 back to the same. You're back to square one, and it, it's maddening. And you're just saying to yourself, "What the hell is going on?" And you know what? I will say, Vernon still has the moves. He still manages to move his feet, and he'll, he he'll get you that first down. Yeah, he he pulled off some 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 amazing Houdini stuff. He really oh, did. He did, and people are still blown away at how how the hell did he escape that? Yeah, and that's not because he was up against a, a lousy defender. No, it's just he's that good of a player. He is that the mobile quarterback that you want on your team. But the reads that he's been making have just been non-existent. And he's trying so hard to make that big play happen. And I mean, he gets the ball downfield, but it's almost like the receiver is like, oh, crap. I Oh, oh it's me. It's me. I, I got to catch that. And then doesn't catch it. 
and it's it's maddening. Like, as I said, it, it, there's just no other way to describe just how how disappointing it is because you're so excited. You think this is going to be the big play that's going to be made, and then nothing. Yeah. And it's 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 deflating it, more it than really, anything else. It really is. It seems like these these teams have been able to. I mean, yeah, Hamilton was coming off of a bye week. Okay, yes, they had a different quarterback under center, um, which seems to be Dane Evans, maybe the starter too, because the Tiger Cats just activated another quarterback, um, as it was shown on the on the transaction wire. Uh, so I don't know what it is. Was it playing in front of the home crowd? It shouldn't be. You should get up for this. And I think they were. I don't think I've ever seen Kahari dance during the game on the sideline, which he was doing. So you could tell he maybe he was trying to get loose. There's just, I don't know. Is it is it hesitancy? Is it frustration? Is it a combination of both? Is it something's got to change leading up to this game versus a very winnable game versus mm-hmm. the Ottawa Red Blacks? A team... That is in, in really worse shape than the Alouettes, in my opinion. Not by much. So, I, I if anything, know. if anything, I think both teams are kind of a carbon copy of each other. I mean, they both both teams have a very solid defense. Both teams have very decent uh, special teams. It's just right now their offense is stinky. <laughs> there's, <laughs> there's just no other way to describe it. I mean, they, that's that's really what it comes down to. There and. Everything comes back to the starting quarterback, Matt Nichols. A lot of people are second guessing him to the point now where it seems like Dominique Davis, who was he was a starter last year or last season in Ottawa to very middling results at best. And I'm probably being very generous in that statement. Now they're thinking about maybe having him and Nichols kind of like doing like a one two punch thing. Mm -hmm. And that's never a good sign. So Montreal would have to capitalize on something like that to try and, but again, they're trying to jumpstart themselves as well. Offensively Montreal, no matter what they've got to get their act together because I don't want to say this game is a gimme. I'm sure a lot of people look at the the red blacks and their woes right now and say like, okay, isn't it funny though, that both Montreal and Ottawa, their sole win came against the Edmonton Elks in Edmonton. Yeah. The only difference is that Ottawa was, pretty lucky to actually win that game like they they just hung on to win that one whereas montreal was dominant in their win against edmonton but since then two straight losses and more questions and answers as far as the the offense goes like it it's it's funny like the, these teams are not so different no no they're not and it's just a matter of oh. I, I think the big difference though is everybody expected ottawa to be a train wreck this year mm-hmm. on, on, on the football field and everybody expected montreal to be a very good team. And right now, Montreal is not living up to expectations. Ottawa is like, the, I mean, the bar is set very low, but they too are able to meet expectations. I mean, this this Friday's game has potential to be a barn burner or just an absolute snooze fest. And I really don't know which way it's going to go. Or a blowout. Well, I mean, yeah. Because when you say barn burner, usually, I, I usually think that, you know, the two teams are scoring at will, that type of thing. But... Yeah, something something has to give. I mean, this is a game, and I said this to you, and, and it's just because of the way the schedule is. I know there are people have a lot of a lot of complaints about the schedule this year, but in my opinion, for the Alouettes to be in contention for the East at the end of the season for a playoff spot, at least second place, the Alouettes need to, to sweep or take three of four of their games versus Ottawa, mm. specifically because they're in division games. Yeah. So, and, and that's that's and this is this is what's really hard right now though is it's almost a no win situation for the Alouettes is if they win this game on Friday it doesn't mean anything because they beat the Red Blacks who everybody expects to be garbage. Right. If they lose this game, things really really are not good because you were expected to beat the Red Blacks. Like that's that that's what it is right now. So it's it's almost a no win situation even if you do win. Uh, like no. <sighs> For sure, Montreal, like there's no must win games. Usually after like three games, there's no such thing as a must win game. Right. But even if Montreal does win this game, okay, they'll be two and two. And but that that doesn't mean things are okay now. It doesn't mean that uh, the ship's been righted. I mean, it's pretty evident that there's a lot of problems right now. Yeah. And they've really got to do some soul searching and figure out what it is. Mm-hmm. And whatever the whatever the problem is has got to be fixed. And a win against Ottawa would help considerably. I don't even want to think about what a loss against Ottawa is going to do. It, it has to go perfect. The Alouettes need to play a perfect game for us to even think, you know, 
that they may that the Alawites may have have made the corrections that are necessary. Mm-hmm. Everything has to go. Everything has to go perfect. From from you know the defense did well. Defense needs to stay the same. The penalties need to stay the same or lower. Yeah, but, discipline. But, but Dis- discipline is going to be key. VA needs to go. You know, sixty. The th- you know, sixty percent passing, close to three hundred yards, a couple of touchdowns. But also, we need to we need to see what the front line can do and get Stanback into the game again. Yeah, they need to create some lanes for him. And it, and if he does get a ha- go get one of those passes, catch the damn thing. Yeah, stop looking upfield. That's because. That was, that's what, at least the first game from what we can see on TV was you, you saw his eyes. He was definitely looking upfield as he was mm-hmm. getting ready to take that ball and, and he was off to the races. But no, that's, that's a big thing. Just catch the ball, then turn upfield. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I agree. And I'm or better the- yet, hmm? get, your, get all of your receivers involved. And I, I, I think there's too much of an insistence to try and make that amazing big play. And yeah, if, if you've got the opportunity to make it, then you make it. But you know, sometimes... Dinks and dunks are going to do it. Like you just got it, it's death by a thousand paper cuts. Just little things here, or there. Just get ten yards at a time. That's how you got to look at it. Just ten yards at a time. Just keep moving the chains. And it, it doesn't. Have, there's no style points in the Canadian Football League. Just march downfield and score touchdowns. It's yeah. you know like as much as we love seeing VA make those amazing throws and Jake Winicky or Gino Lewis make those ridiculous catches. At the end of the day, just move the ball downfield worry about the style stuff afterwards mm-hmm. like just you gotta score touchdowns that's all there is to I, it i agree I agree they need and they they gotta control it they really they do like you did for, it's funny cliff we go back what could have been if va had not thrown that interception when they were driving versus calgary which could have made it 21-3 yep this team could easily be two and one or better oh, or much better because i think that had they won that game against calgary the, I, I think uh, hamilton would have been even more panicked. I think they would have probably made more mistakes trying to see if they can knock off the Alouettes. And I think if, if VA played that same game, he played in Edmonton against Hamilton, it would have been another blowout. Like Montreal could be very well be three and O because Hamilton did not play that well this past Friday. No, they really they didn't. did. They did just enough to win and props to them for doing so. They, yeah. they did what they had to do. Yep. They have to control the line early, yeah. early, Line as we're taping right now from Bet Regal has the Alouettes favored by seven points, with yeah. with an over under of forty three. And based, you know, I, I, that's really based on what what Ottawa has not done. I mean, they've not scored an offensive touchdown. Is it is it in three games? I think so. So like, yeah, they. I, I thank goodness they have Lewis Ward still kicking field goals for them because <laughs> he he's been doing the job. He's been doing what he has to do. This uh, game. And you're saying how, you know, Ottawa and Montreal, you know, even though it is one of the games that are going to be played during Labor Day weekend, um, you know, we, we aren't, I still think that we have, the Owls have, a, have they're trying to make this into a, a, a huge rivalry, which, which I think it will be sooner or later because they're, they will be a natural rival. Mm-hmm. You know, they're just down the road. But dude, this game really reminds me of, I'm trying to remember the year. Because as I said, I, I think we went into Calgary thinking, oh, okay, well, we're, you know, we're, we're going to be okay. You're not going to be able to, you know, we're going we're gonna to beat them because of, of the quarterback, da 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 But this game kind of, kind of, kind of reminds me of the tooth, was it? I'm trying to remember here. I don't have the right, here it is. Yeah, no, it's the wrong game. I'm trying to think. It wasn't, it was a, Canada Day game versus the Ottawa Renegades. Was it the 05 game versus the, the Canada Day game where we, we go in there thinking, oh, the Alouettes are going to, Alouettes are going to, yeah, it was that game. That the Alouettes yeah, were going to smash them. They were up yeah. big, and then yeah, they, they ended up it. losing the game in overtime, if yep. I remember correctly. That is correct. That's, unfortunately, that's what this game is making me think of, Cliff. And that's not a good sign. Yeah, the Owls <laughs> are up 23 points. In the third quarter, going into the fourth, and ended up losing. Mm-hmm. This, for whatever reason, Cliff, this game remi- is reminding. It, it, I'm getting deja vu of this game for some Already. reason. Even though it's not the same Alouettes, it's later on in the season. I get that. So it's 05. Oh yeah, but it. I don't know, dude. I just, I'm just getting 05 Canada Today vibes all over again. And wouldn't it be just like Matt Nichols to all of a sudden snap out of his funk 
and just light up the the Alouettes. Yeah. Like, and that's the thing. If, if Montreal definitely can't afford to take anyone lightly anymore. I mean, I think there's a little part of me that was kind of thinking just based on that, that first game against Edmonton that maybe they were thinking, okay, no Bo Levi Mitchell. We got this. We're going to run rough shot over this no-name quarterback. And look what happened. They were fighting for their life to the very end and still came up short. Mm-hmm. And now you go in and, okay, against Hamilton, they're also winless. They're also a desperate team. They got a bunch of stars banged up, uh, change quarterback, try to change, you know make something happen. Look what happens there. I mean, they they I I I can't help but wonder if the Salouettes team just they're not as good as they think they are. And uh, I, I hate to say it, but you are what your record says you are. And right now, the Alouettes are one and two. And they need they, to be they, ca- they need to be careful too, because as as anybody who's following the current CFL knows what happened in with Edmonton and Toronto because of the outbreak in Edmonton. In my opinion, I don't see the game. There's how the game's going to be rescheduled. They need to think of this Toronto team at being three and one. Mm-hmm. With them in my again for me, I think I think Toronto will get the default win over Edmonton. I think so, and and they should because they didn't do anything wrong. No. Now there are some changes heading into this week's game. For the Alouettes. And I know you had the list in front of you. And those who may have not followed the transaction wire or follow what Herb or the Herb said in the in the uh, in the Gazette or through uh, French media. What are the changes that we know of so far for the Alouettes versus the Red Blacks this weekend? Well, I think the most notable change will be in especially to an, an effort to jumpstart the offense is Dante Absher is now going to be in the lineup and Quan Bray is not. Uh there's nothing that suggests that Quan Bray is hurt, but he really hasn't been able to provide that offensive spark. This, even though even though he did score a touchdown last week, it's he's been pretty much a ghost for most of the most of the season. So Dante Absher is a player that's very exciting. Someone I think has a lot of potential uh, due to the ratio and just due to the players that were in front of him. Just mm-hmm. wasn't able to crack that initial lineup, but uh, now he's going to get a chance to go in and. He, as I recall, played a, a very solid game in 20, November 2019, the last uh, game of the regular season, which was also against the Ottawa Red Blacks. So he he kind of knows what uh, you know what it's like to have a good game at TD play. So I fully expect him to get used in this uh, situation. Uh, Tony Washington looks like he's going to be out, and he'll be replaced by Chris Schlugler. Sch- Schlugler? I, I don't think I'm pronouncing his name right, and I apologize for that. Bless you. <laughs> Yeah, he's like, but uh, he also too, uh, interesting enough, came in relief for Tony Washington in late 2019 when Washington broke his leg. Yep, and he did a very admirable job filling in on the blind side. So I'm curious to see if he if if, if he's able to step up and help this offensive line, which I think has been doing a pretty good job, all things considered. Because Vernon's getting he's getting opportunities. Like the, it would be nice if they can create some more lanes for Stanback to run, but. I think for the most part, when it comes to protecting the quarterback, this offensive line has done a very good job. So if Schluger can get in there, you know, do do exactly what Tony Washington is expected to do and not look out of place. I still think that's a huge win and a good opportunity for him to to shine and protect his quarterback. Uh, any worries? Because, you know, Washington was listed as having a knee. That's why he didn't participate. That's what says why they've made the change. Um, Antonio Simmons also, he was limited, but we'll see what happens with, with the elbow. Uh, as you said, uh, Schluger has been a healthy scratch for, for, I think, for most of the week, but he's now going to come in for him, uh, for Washington. Mm-hmm. Uh, in your opinion, Cliff, by the way, because, uh, you know, Cameron Artis Payne, who was another running back for the Gals, he's been a you know healthy scratch, but he had full participation. How much do you think until he's activated? Well, I mean, this, Stanbeck this is, is the- yeah, I understand Stanbeck is our quote unquote star. Yep. But, but as we've seen, Calgary with the quarterback, the quarterbacks that their their new backup, their new starters done well. Even though, by the way, even though Bo Levi has been uh, has been taken off the sixth game, what the hell? <laughs> I, I don't get that. I I don't know if that's mind games. If uh, Calgary is just trying to, there's no way he's playing. <laughs> anyway, I, I'd be surprised. Let's let's put it that way. I'd yeah. be very surprised. Or or maybe they're showcasing Bo Levi. Mm-hmm. Maybe they want to get rid of him in that uh, big ass contract of his. Wow. Because a certain team who also wears red and black is also having woes with their quarterback. 
Well, it, it, it's funny that you say that. And anybody who didn't watch this past week's Turf District podcast, you know, the guys for, for the Elks, they had, they had their yearly Labor Day thing, you know, between, you know, Calgary and Edmonton. And, um, yeah, they had Ryan on from Calgary, uh, from the, what is it, what no. is it his pod the hor- again? Horseman Radio. Yeah, Horseman Radio. And he brought up a very good point. It's like, go, oh, do you need somebody? Here, here's somebody. It, it, you know, everybody, it, you know, the, it's a player making machine in Calgary, and they seem to be giving everybody their back with quarterbacks or, or started, you know what I mean? So it's what you just said is interesting, but it wouldn't surprise me in the least. <laughs> Nor should it. And you think about it, I think Calgary is a plug and play offense. Like you, it's it's proven. It, you, you see, Jake Myers doing an admirable job in Bo Levi's absence, just like Nick Arbuckle did, and he, he managed to parlay that into a starting job yeah. in the Canadian Football League. Who's to say Calgary doesn't swing in a, a massive deal with with the Red Blacks, send Matt Nichols to Calgary to be the backup with a couple of draft picks, and let Bo Levi restart, rekindle himself in Ottawa, who desperately needs a quarterback. If Matt Nichols ain't, isn't doing the job, I'm sure Bo Levi can step in and help just give a shot in the arm to the Red Blacks. I mean, it's the CFL. Crazier things have happened. Yeah, I know. Heck, Bo Levi almost became an Argonaut. <laughs> I know. So, don't <laughs> oh, say that, man. you know, this guy's not tradable. I mean, yeah, he's got a pretty big contract. But at the end of the day, you do what you got to do to make it work. And I, I, I don't know if Ottawa is willing to pull that trigger, but I mean that it's definitely food for thought when you sit and think about. It. And Calgary would more than likely he they'd listen, just seeing as how well Jake Meyer has done or Mayer has done for in relief of Bo Levi. Never say never, folks. I mean, this is the Canadian Football League. I mean, you there, there's been crazy stuff like this happening for years, and it'll keep on happening. Yeah, I agree. Um, we love Alouettes fans. We love the Alouettes. You know, no apologies for our complaints this, at the beginning of the show because we there need to be improvements made, and obviously now too there there need to be improvements made on the field too. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I mean, mean, we we can't control that. That's the one thing. But one thing we can control, as far as I'm concerned, is the off the field stuff, as far as in game presentations and overall fan experiences. Yeah. If we don't make our voices heard, nothing changes. Yeah. That, that's really what it comes down to. And as far as I'm concerned, these are all the stuff that we, we listed off. It's all correctable stuff. It's not stuff that's out of anybody's control. This yeah. is all very, very controllable and stuff that can be in, implemented almost immediately. Yep. And if we didn't care, we wouldn't say anything. We would just go about and just happily dump our money in, in the stadium, buy all the swag and buy the tickets and shut our mouths. And that's not us. That's, yeah. that's not what we're here to do. We're here to represent we're yep. here to represent for the fans, for the season ticket holders, for everybody that's associated with the Alouettes, because we know what this team is capable of. We know that they can put together a better product, both on and off the field. I I really want to believe in my heart of hearts that this is a bit of a, a lull right now as far as what's going on on the field. It's going to correct itself. I have faith in Kahari and his coaches. And yes, I still have very much a lot of faith in Vernon Adams yeah. and what he can do. It'll come together. I'm not worried about that. Everything that happens inside Percival Molson Stadium from a fan perspective, all the all the gaffes that we saw this past Friday, hopefully it's just a one-time thing. Hopefully they realize, after listening to this, that they can do better and that they'll be better. That's all we can hope for. And guess what? You've got three weeks to get it right. That's the next home game, September 18th, on a Saturday. Lots of time to get all these issues that we talked about. There's lots of time to unmake the mistakes. Yep. Um, yeah. I, I agree. I completely agree. So we are on social media. Don't forget. Uh, again, we, remember we got the contest running this week. We will be putting out what exactly we're giving away on social media. Make sure you take part if you if you want a, uh, some some free swag. Hey, who doesn't like free swag? Who uh, doesn't like free swag? I know. Uh, miss any of the uh, the previous episodes of the podcast? You can head over to AlawitzFlightDeck.ca and catch up on what you missed. Uh, you can also catch up on our our channel over on YouTube. And by the way, that's the next thing now. If you can get us to 100 followers, we're going to be giving away something else. So if you can go over to our YouTube page, just go over to YouTube and search for Alouette's Flight Deck and give us a follow. Uh, and uh, if we can get us to 100, we'll be giving away something else. And also, we are on social media. Um, you know, Alouette's, Alouette's FL Deck. Cliff is that at Cliffy D. 
I'm at, uh, at Repact, R-E-P-P-A-C-T. Um, also, if you're besides heading over to the website, you know, if you do that, don't forget that we do have merch. And for those of you did who, uh, you know, we had a, a pretty sweet, you know, promo code. All of you who took advantage of it. Congratulations for those of you who didn't. What's wrong with you? It's 21% off. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's some substantial, man. That's- yeah. Uh, stay tuned. We have a couple of new designs coming soon. So if you have a head over to teespring.com slash stores slash Al's flight deck, you can check out everything there that we have at the store. And also, uh, again, it, besides the, the main, the, the main website, if you check on all of the, basically all of the podcast providers, you will be able to find us there. Just do a search for Alouette's flight deck. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's so so many different ways for you to enjoy the podcast, folks. Uh, we definitely hope that you you like, you subscribe, uh, you let us, you know, give us the good feedback, the bad feedback. We want to hear it all. How can we improve the show? What are we doing right? I mean, we we want to hear what you have to say about this because let's face it, folks, this is your show as well. We want you to be a part of this. We like I said, we're we're not above you know handing out free stuff in order to get you to. To comment, to like, subscribe, to be a part of it. We want you to interact with us. So please, whether you do it on social media, check out the show through YouTube, through any of our podcast platforms, by all means, whatever it takes, we definitely appreciate each and every one of you supporting the Alouette's Flight Deck. Yep. And we started something brand new today. I don't think you can really follow somebody until you actually join. Uh, we've joined the the new uh, Canadian, uh, I guess they're a new social network in a way. It's called uh, iLily. Um, and we will, there are 15 second, uh, blips that you'll be seeing from myself. And uh, I don't know, I think Cliff, you were thinking of joining too. I am um, joining. Yep. And, uh, you'll be able to get our, our, our feedback on and everything from owls to everything else. Um, so stay tuned and look at our social media for that. And then make sure if you do join I Lily, make sure that you, uh, uh that you, uh, that you follow us. And by the way, that is I Lily and it is I L I, what is it? <laughs> that, that it's it's not easy. I it's I L I, so it's I L I L L I dot C O. So I Lily. Yeah. Worst case scenario, folks, just go to either one of our Twitter pages, and we'll be posting links. We'll you know you yeah. can interact that way. That's probably a lot easier than trying exactly. to figure out how to, how to exactly. spell this. <laughs> uh, any uh, any last bits you want to bring up, Cliff, before we uh, before we head off this week? Uh, well, uh, as you may or may not know, uh, NFL Cut Down Day was uh, was this week, mm-hmm. and uh, of interest to Alouettes fans, uh, there's a couple of Alouettes draft picks that uh, ended up making practice rosters for their respective teams, uh, which is great for their careers for these young men, but uh, also means that we won't be seeing these guys in Alouettes uniforms anytime soon. Uh, most notable is uh, Carter O'Donnell made the Indianapolis Colts practice roster as well as this year's uh, first round draft pick, or I guess, sorry, second round draft pick in uh, Pierre-Olivier Lestage. He is now a part of the Seattle Seahawks practice roster. So good on these guys for proving that Canadian talent definitely belongs in the National Football League. Yeah, I think, by uh, the way, I think the Rams have four, four Canadians on their roster, mm-hmm. if I remember correctly. Yep, four Canadian board players. So, I mean, yep. like, believe me, with, there's tons of Canadian talent out there, folks, and even more in the pipeline as well. Like, the NCAA has quite a few superstars in waiting that just happen to have been born in the Great White North. So, it's it's an exciting time for Canadian football. Like, Canadian football players are growing by leaps and bounds. And if they don't make it in the NFL, you'll see them in a CFL field near you very soon. Mm-hmm. So, it's, I mean, props to O'Donnell and Lestage for making the practice roster. Uh, like I said, it's a bummer because it means we won't be, if, if we see him in Alois uniform, it won't be for the next couple of years, but just know that the pipeline is strong. Like there's definitely a lot of depth as far as I'm concerned. A lot of guys that were taken in the futures so that, you know, maybe need a year or two in the slow cooker to marinate. But uh, if we ever see these guys in Alois uniforms, be very excited. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, stay tuned, even though the Alouettes will be on a bye week next week, we still have more. We will have stuff to talk about, including this past week's uh, Labor Day Friday game. I guess that's is that a term that we could use. Uh, I, I yeah. mean, it's part of Labor Day weekend, I guess. Yeah, I, I mean, guess that's so. in, yeah. in a very abstract way, but yeah, for yeah. sure. And uh, yeah, it, it will lead into our bye week, and uh, uh, we will have stuff to talk about. We got a couple of things on, uh, up our sleeves, so uh, 
Uh, but stay tuned to all of our social media outlets. So, so for everybody here at the Elowitz Flight Deck for Cliffy D, I'm Tim Capper. Ron, final approach.